Hello, uh, welcome. I'm Professor Chad Jenkins. Uh, this is uh, Robotics 511 uh, and EECS uh, 367 uh, being offered for fall semester of 2020. Uh, this is a, my lecture uh, for these courses uh, that deal with intro to autonomous robotics and robot operating systems on dynamics numerical integration. Um, and so before I go on, I'm just gonna say a few words. So hi, I'm still in my house and I'm still teaching from home right now. Um, I, it's, uh, it's, I, it's been great to see everybody work on, on uh, assignment one and get their path planners up and working. Um, the next stage in this is really just talk about how do we, uh, how do we, how can we simulate these types of systems so we can start to put a robot arm on it. So we have mobility, we can think about mobility. Now we want to start, start thinking about how we can build a manipulator for this arm, model it, control it, simulate the dynamics and be able to do it, have it do purposeful things like being able to grab something and go put it somewhere else. And these types of pick and place tasks are really important all throughout robotics. And so that's what we're going to talk about uh, today in this lecture. And so with that, I'm going to go head back to my slides and then I'm going to... Um, so when we're thinking about these types of uh, dynamics and numerical integration, what we're really talking about is physics. And so when I think of physics, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, is Isaac Newton uh, sitting in the you know sitting um, under the tree and and watching the watching the apple drop and getting the the insights needed to uh, to start to develop our laws of physics. Um, and so, uh, whoops. And so uh, for uh, for Isaac Newton, you know this this came back in the in the um, and back in the 1600s, the late 1600s, um, and developed really the the foundation for how we think about uh, how we think about physics on sort of uh, in, in, our, in our most most practical ways. Although there's other ways of thinking about physics, if you think about you know quantum mechanics or, or things like that. Um, but it's so pervasive that even kids today, you know, they, they, you know, they know the story about Isaac Newton and the apple and, uh, and how he sort of thought about gravity in these ways. Um, like everything, you know, the stories that we have don't always match reality. So there's like, so there's what actually maybe happened with the, with the apple. And, you know, and I think, uh, and so, you know, so when we go from stories to reality, there's always a, a little bit of an embellishment that, that happens so that everybody can understand. Um, but what's important for us, and I just I just share this as an interesting story. Um, but what's what's important for us is that uh, is that what he uses, along with uh, along with ideas that that Euler put together, uh, sort of taking Newton's ideas and, and taking that that much further. Um, you know that really is what gave us the gave us the basis for uh, for the simulation tools that we need in order to uh, in order to to simulate the actions of robots on various types of systems. And so this is uh, so this is Newton's second law, along with uh, that's you know that's uh, that if we think about it, is meant for for the translational motion of rigid bodies, and then or extended it to think about uh, so think about general rigid body systems. And so that's what we use. So this is the the KUKA lightweight arm using the VREP simulator. Um, we, you, we need these tools for, for many different reasons to make our robots do things in a purposeful manner. And so really, if we go back to how we're thinking about robot operating systems, you know, we think our, of our stack, we start at the lowest level, which is hardware, we build on top of, um, of computing operating systems to build robot operating systems that allow us to build controllers and, uh, and other types of uh, other types of processes that are needed specifically for robots, so we can make robot applications and deliver to our users in, uh, in uncertain worlds uh, with with all sorts of interesting dynamics. Um, and as we take the rob as we take sort of uh, autonomy from the digital world into the physical world, and so. Um, so dynamical simulation gives us uh, gives the tools to to think about this uh, in these sort of hypothetical worlds. So in, in addition to real hardware we'd have with the robot, we also can have simulated hardware that we can. So we can we can use those to get an idea of what our what are doing what we're doing with these robots before we go out and put them into practice, and you know potentially lose a lot of money uh, because we're because we're um, because robots are still very expensive. Um, and so, uh, so these types of data, we'll talk about how we can build this sort of, we can start to build or start to think about this simulated hardware and in terms of dynamical simulation systems. And that's, how, this is how it sort of fits on our stack. If we go back and think about all the things that we need to do in a robot operating system, uh, last time in lecture two, we covered path planning and hopefully your path, path planners are coming together. Uh, this lecture, we'll talk about dynamical simulation and so how we can, um, 
how we can simulate physics. And then that'll lead, and it's complementary to the next lecture on feedback control about uh, once we have these systems, if there are motors on them, how we can control those motors and, and, uh, and deal with the physical system so we can make our, 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 uh, our robot do what we need it to do. And so that's sort of where we, where we sit in this, this uh, the scheme of things. Um, so as we're moving into dynamical uh, simulation, I just uh, I, I I put this to you. Just think about a second. What what am I trying to say in in this slide? Uh, you know what is uh, what is this and why is it why is it so important to what we do in robotics? So think about that while I, while I get some coffee real quick. All right. Got an answer? All right. I'll take anything. Think about it. All right. Uh, if you got what I was trying to say here, you would know that I am saying uh, classical mechanics, and so <laughs> so these are some um, classical composers posers doing uh, doing the work of mechanics, and so uh, so my little funny joke here is is that I'm taught I'm building up to to how we think about uh, about classical mechanics, and so this is really the laws that we use to to describe our our physical world in a, in a way that we can predict outcomes and, uh, and model the system so that we can build, so we can build uh, devices and structures and control algorithms that, that, uh, that will work in our, in our, in our physical system will work in reality. Um, and so really this is about the physical laws that describe the, the action of bodies under, a, under action of a system of forces. Um, and this sort of breaks down into two forms, uh, two, two things that we think about. Um, the first is kinematics. And so, Kinematics is, is really the, you know, how bodies can, how, what types of geometry, what types of configuration can they, can they take on? And so this is really thinking about, you know, about space without, re with respect to the forces. And so that's the, and for my body, it's the different types of poses that my body could be in. Uh, similarly, there's the action of forces, which brings leads to dynamics. And so this is really how do how does a, a physical system evolve over time? And so how could the kinematics be impacted by forces and dynamics and thinking about time explicitly? And so this is sort of governed by things like like the like the Newton's second law, which we sort of all know from high school physics. And so at a high level, this is really, you know, kinematics is really about sort of the geometry of motion. So it expresses the possible range of states, of, of configurations that a robot could, uh, that could, could take on. And dynamics is really thinking about in the space of kinematics, how can a system, how can the kinematics evolve over time with respect to the laws of physics that have been, uh, that have been prescribed for us. And so this is really about, you know, it's about evolution over time. And so when we, just to give an example of how these put together, this is from a paper I did with, uh, with my colleagues, Pavel Rotek and uh, Morgan McGuire. Um, this is from about 15 years ago. Um, what you're gonna see in, in black is, uh, is purely kinematic motion capture data. So that's somebody getting into a rig, having green screen like the one I have behind me um, and, or something like that. And then we capture their motion, but we're only thinking about the kinematics. Um, and somebody is hitting me on Slack right now. Um, uh, you may have or hear a lot of that while we're, while we're doing this because I'm at home. Uh, and then the other three are, are, are dynamically simulated. So we use a, so we use a physics ba based engine. So at this time, this was the open dynamics engine. And, uh, and with that, we can, we can hit these, these characters with a bunch of different, different objects. So we're just throwing balls at them, evaluating different control strategies. But you'll see that the one in black doesn't react, especially now when we hit them with something really big. And so, uh, and so really, you know, kinematics is, you know, is without respect to, to physics and collision. Uh, dynamical simulation lets us think about that. But we can also use the kinematics as, a, as sort of a reference trajectory, at least for our control strategies. So in that regard, let's start with a, with a simple example. Um, just to get our, you know, we'll build up to, to humanoids at some point, but, uh, but let's start with, with, with the simplest example that we could think about for how we can simulate a system. And, uh, and that's, that's really our motorized pendulum. So imagine you have, uh, you, have a, you have a point mass, so it doesn't really have geometry, it's just a particle in space, and it has a, it has a, has a, mass, uh, a mass with it. So it's a, it's a pendulum, so, so that, that point mass is out there. And it's attached to, uh, to uh, you know, it's attached um, to a rigid rod uh, that is of length L, which, and that rod has no mass to it as well. Um, we're going to assume that, the, that this pendulum can, uh, can swing uh, about, about an axis, so it can swing about a point, uh, only in one degree of freedom. And so, uh, so that the angle that is, that, that is, uh, that is taken, uh, that the, that, um, 
that the pendulum's at with respect to this uh, this axis is uh, is theta, and so this is our this is our range of motion. Um, in addition, we're assuming that that beyond sort of your standard pendulum, this one actually can produce motor force, and so uh, so there's a force, a torque that can be applied uh, to this uh, to the to the pendulum uh, using this sort of uh, this sort of motor that we have there, and so uh, we should note that that torque is really an angular force, not a linear force in this case. Um, and then we also have what's called a, an equation of motion. We'll spend a lot of time during this lecture talking about this equation of motion, which describes the dynamics of our system, uh, which describes how this, uh, what is the, you know, this is essentially what you're seeing right here is, uh, is F equals MA in, in uh, angular form for our, for our pendulum that we have here. And so we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. Just in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, naming the words we use in nomenclature, we'll call the pendulum Everything that, that you're seeing here is a system. So this describes a pen, you know, a uh, uh, the type of you know it, it describes the type of system that we're that we're thinking about. It des describes the scenario, let's say, and in that in the, inside of that system there can be a configuration that's taken on. So you can describe the the configuration of the system at any time using the the angle theta, uh, which we're calling a degree of freedom. The motor that's 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 here is called is a control. So we can ap apply controls to this uh, to this motor by by applying motor force through this torque. And the dynamics of this equation of motion essentially says how the how the state of the system will evolve over time, uh, given that we have a motor torque and we know the the, the state at any particular moment. Um, and so so this is really you know and this is really what we're what we're gonna what, what we're gonna use. Let's first talk, talk about defining state and knowing that our state is comprised of what we call degrees of freedom. Uh, degrees of freedom describe the, ro the, the ways that the system can, can move. Uh, in the case of, uh, of many of, of our, our, our common systems, they have uh, translational rotational axes for movement about robot joints. Um, and so, you know, so if we take our, uh, our airplane right here, let's say we have an airplane. Um, how many, how many, Degrees of freedom do you think this airplane may have? Um, well, think about it for one second. I won't go get my coffee this time. All right, you got it? All right, so this, this, uh, this airplane has six degrees of freedom. Uh, and so three of those degrees of freedom are translational. So that talks about where the, that talks about the X, Y, Z locations about where the, where the airplane could be in space, you know, what point in space it's taking up. In addition, it has three, it has three um, rotational degrees of freedom uh, that describe the orientation of the plane, a roll, uh, a pitch, and a yaw. And so these three, these three angles describe the orientation of the, of the airplane. So we have a six degree of freedom system. So um, but we're not limited to just six degree of freedom systems. Uh, we could think about, so if we come back to our humanoid, uh, how many humanoids, uh, you know, degrees of freedom are there in a humanoid? Um, well, there can be, there can be many. Um, so, uh, so if we're just taking, uh, you know, this example, this is from the, from the old Georgia Tech animation lab. Um, this is a, this is a humanoid character. This is in the, in the lower left. Um, you can see that there's a number of degrees of freedom. You know, there's a one degree of freedom, let's say in the elbow, maybe three degrees of freedom in the waist. So for you're moving around, you know, the neck may have one, or if it's a really stiff one, maybe two. Um, and so, you know, and so all of these degree of freedoms, the degrees of freedom together talk about this, the, um, the motions, the types of configurations that the, that the, that humanoid can take on that also applies for robots, such as the PR2, our fetch that we use, um, any robot that we might, might, might want to model and control. Um, these degree of freedom. So when we think about degrees of freedom in generally, we should note that every that every robot is going to be comprised of a collection of rigid bodies, um, and so each rigid body is we're going to call a link. And every link on our robot is going to have a coordinate system, and that coordinate system is what we're going to call a frame or coordinate frame. Um, and so joints. Uh, uh, joints connect uh, two rigid bodies together and prescribe how one body can move with respect to another body. So, for instance, if we have a hinge joint in this case, uh, that hinge joint has a rotate has a has a rotational axis, and so uh, so one of the bodies can rotate with respect to the other body about that axis, and that is going to have one degree one rotational degree of freedom. Uh, similarly, there's other types of joints that we can consider. Uh, such as the prismatic joint, where one where you have an axis and one body can translate along that axis with respect to a to another uh, another object. You could also have a ball and socket joint, where there's where there's really sort of three degrees of freedom, 
um, and you can rotate about all of those. And so you could, you know, and so I don't really know how to actuate a, a, mo a ball and socket joint with, with the motor. There's probably ways to do it, you know, you know, artificial muscles and things like that. But if you think about my, the, your, a human shoulder, you know, that's more of a ball and socket and we don't have necessarily a, an electrical motor that sits inside of that. It's actuated by muscles on the outside. And so that ball and socket is really, uh, is, you know, I think feels more biological to me. Um, but then again, I'm a computer scientist, so, uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, and so the, uh, so we should note that motor force exerts, uh, exerts along this degree of freedom, uh, to essentially, uh, to actually move one body with respect to another body. And we use linear transformations that we'll talk to later when we, when we get to forward kinematics to relate the coordinate frames of one body with respect to another body, um, with one link with respect to another link. Um, as well as the positioning of the joints in, in, in these cases. We should note that, that even though we're sort of showing these, uh, these, these links with, that have, that have uh, spatial geometry, that's not really necessarily what we, what we use in terms, of, uh, in terms of describing these robot systems. Um, you know, we're really concentrated on the frames. We, ye we need the spatial geometry in, though, in order to detect collisions. Um, and so that's so usually we, we're going to represent the robot with respect to the frames, the collision geometry, and then uh, they also have inertial uh, inertial uh, properties for the um, to talk about the how we simulate the the robot as well. So just a few more definitions, and that we should note that robots, uh, robotic machines, are comprised of n joints and n plus one links. So if a robot has n joints, it will have n plus one links, just given that a link connect, we, that comes from a link connecting two bodies. Um, the, types of, uh, the types of robots that we're gonna think about in this class are gonna be open chain robots, which means that these joints uh, and links form a tree of articulated motion, uh, and there can be no cycles in that tree. So there's no, you know, you can't, if you're traversing between, through joints to, through two links and, and then back through other links, uh, back to other joints, uh, you can never come back, you can never cycle. Uh, there's gonna be no cycles in that traversal. Um, and so, so we're gonna consider that there's gonna be, because this is a tree, we're gonna consider the, 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 the top of the hierarchy, the one, uh, the one link that's at the top of this hierarchy to be the base link. Um, and we should note that every link is going to have one, has one, exactly one parent joint, um, but potentially zero to multiple numbers of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of joints, of child joints uh, in this hierarchy. And, um, and there's a special case, so what I'm showing here are serial chain robots, uh, and these are cases where every link has exactly one, one child joint. Um, and so that's sort of, sort of what this looks like in our, in our hierarchy. Um, so let's also consider some other examples of robots, because um, we won't just necessarily have these types. Um, and so first I would say there's a, there's a great project uh, from, my, from, my, uh, from my colleague, Professor Le Marie, um, the, the Icon 2 uh, project. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, and this, this robot draws people. And so, uh, so the person that's sitting there, uh, they take a nice picture of them. And then the robot here is a planar two link arm that can draw, that can draw a, sort of a portrait of you. Um, if we take out the, you know, the, the, um, the, the, the link at the end that is, that is picking up and putting down the pen, what we really have is a planar, a planar two link arm. So we have, so it's really just sort of like, a, you know, um, uh, you know, a shoulder and an elbow, and then that wrist is doing the action of the of the a pen and, of the to bring the pen down. Uh, but it's all staying in, inside of the plane. Um, and so these types of robots are good. Give them a little press right here. There you go. Uh, you can go go to the and my slides are all online, so you can check those out as well. Um, and so the way we sort of look at a, uh, at an arm like this is so so in this system, what they have is a camera looking down. And then this robot can take on uh, can take on sort of a variety of different positions inside of this this planar workspace, um, and so in this case we can model this robot in this form. Uh, this robot has two degrees of freedom, uh, and so that so those two degrees of freedom are described by alpha one. I mean. Uh, theta one and theta two. Um, and so this, is, this represents the angle of the shoulder and the angle of the elbow. And then this also has links, with, then it has three links uh, with, with uh, frames on them. So you have your base frame, uh, which is gonna be link zero. Uh, at the elbow, you'll have link one, a coordinate frame there. And then at the end, the tool frame or the end effector frame is going to be link two. And so that's how we can think about a robot of this form. 
Um, if we, so you can sort of generalize this into a type of robot that you commonly see in a number of applications. I, you know, I think I usually see these in sort of laboratory environments where you have to move chemicals from one place to another or some sort of testing environment like that. You have a SCARA arm. Um, and so this is just showing it, you know, picking up stuff inside of what we call a work cell. Um, and so this is really very similar to the, to the, to the robot that we saw before um, that was doing the drawing, um, except it just has a prismatic joint at the end for, for, taking the, for taking the end effector down and being able to pick up things. Um, the fetch robot sort of takes this to, uh, to a, a larger extreme in that we, have, we now have a, a robot with many different, uh, many different uh, uh, rotational joints, but also can translate. So the, the back of the robot can move up and, um, and we can move the gripper. That's going to be a, a, a translational joint, as well as the base. So the, the, the base of the robot can move, uh, can move in, in sort of any form, any place in the, in the, um, in the, in, in the plane. So it can move around sort of your, 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 uh, or move on the floor sort of anywhere. Um, we should note that, that we can break this up into the links and the joints of the, of the fetch. And so we have, we have this type of schematic. And we can just watch this this robot do things. Uh, so this is all the joints working in order to in order to uh, to place boxed water down on the table. Um, and so this was uh, this was a project we did just uh, to serve some drinks to people. And so uh, and so this gives you a sense of the kind of degrees of freedom that we have. We still have what's called the differential drive uh, uh, wheels on the bottom to make the, make the robot move around. And so these are two wheels that that spin to basically move uh, move around, but. Um, and that's not very human-like, and so uh, so there are humanoid robots such as that, uh, such as the Boston Dynamics Atlas that's here. Um, and so this is a bipedal system, and so it can it has two legs and it can move around. This is just sort of showing uh, this. My colleague, my colleagues at WPI made this schematic of the uh, of the joints and links of uh, of the atlas. And, uh, and we can watch this working in simulation. So this is uh, from the DARPA Robotics Challenge. The robot is trying to, uh, trying to get into the car and drive it away. Um, and you should note, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's not restricted to the floor the way that the way our fetch robot has been. It's, uh, it can move around, it's got legs, and so it can try to move in spaces that, that humans can move around. And so there it goes, it's off and, off and running. Now this is from, from Technion, so I just wanna give them credit. And so, uh, and so, you know, so we can, so this is a real robot. It, it was used for a number of different, uh, different uh, situations. Um, but, uh, and, and so, but, but we simulated, this robot was simulated and why would you simulate a robot? Um, but there's many, many reasons why you would do that. Um, uh, the first is that real robots are expensive. Uh, if you write an improper controller or, uh, or you don't test your controller, uh, that could break this robot. And if you're talking about an Atlas or Fetch, uh, you know, um, or, you know, one of these robots that could cost, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, um, you don't want to take those types of chances um, because some of these robots are even irreplaceable. Um, but also, if you have certain types of control, uh, you may need a model of dynamics in order for it to work. So if you think about things like optimal control or model predictive control, uh, you know, you need a, what you're really doing is a search over the, the over, over possibilities, over the dynamics. And so you need that model of dynamics to say, if I do this action in this state, what's going to, what's going to happen next. And then I got it. Then from that state, I got to predict what's going to happen after that. And that gives me an idea of, uh, of, you know, what kind of outcomes it would, would result. And so it's sort of like your own, the robot's own internal model of what could happen. Um, and there's also just a number of simulation packages that are that are out there already. So you can get uh, you know robot simulation packages that build on top of off of physics engines. So if you're seeing physics in a movie or a video game, they might be using these types of uh, physical simulation engines. But uh, and then robot simulation packages oftentimes build on that. And there's a variety out there. You can go and you can go and pick. I'm not. I don't think you should. You know, just in general, you should know what's going on inside of these systems because they're because there's nothing. There's no better model than the real world of itself simulation will always sort of take some sort of shortcuts so but so that's why we're we're going through this to know what is inside of these systems and how can we how can we um how can we both build it and understand what's going inside of of these types of engines um and to give an example of why we do this uh, consider the nasa valkyrie so um so there's a group at, at ihmc whoops going to turn that down a little bit. Um, so at, uh, at IHM, HMC, they have a, they have a, a NASA Valkyrie robot. And so, uh, so, uh, so 
this robot essentially can, is a biped it can move around and they've written great controllers so this robot can uh, can move around space um you know slowly but it is a major feat that they are able to do this um but you can notice that they have on the top of it tethers in case it falls down uh, they don't just destroy this robot, which uh, which which I'm assuming cost many, many millions of dollars. Uh, so you don't want to mess around. Um, so but when you're thinking about that, uh, what you're seeing is the end result of a lot of development. So consider all the testing that they had to do in simulation, which may have looked something like this. And so I grabbed this off of YouTube. Um, and so this is just sort of. Uh, you know, this is just sort of showing some examples of test runs that were that were using the the um, using the Valkyrie. And so, whenever there's a whenever there's a misstep, you know, or you see it falling, maybe they just start over. And so, this is just some uh, some funny examples of uh, of of the robot uh, not necessarily behaving the way that they are that they're hoping. But we do that so we can test. Um, I should also say that there that. I watch a lot of robot videos and the music choices that they have there are really interesting. Uh, so, so just for a brief minute, they said they had the, the hovering sojourn uh, by dream theater. I listened to it is all right. Uh, I just thought one of the comments was interesting that, that uh, they called it alien dubstep. I don't really know what to think about that. I just thought it was entertaining. So, uh, so we'll move on. Um, and so this gets to the first robot that we are going to, that we're going to model and control, uh, which is the, the pendulum. And so, uh, so the pendulum is really just a one degree of freedom pendulum that is gonna that's gonna represent our uh, our, our our motorized pendulum. And so we're going to uh, simulate the physics of this system. Then we're then uh, and that's what we're going to talk about how we do that in this in this lecture. So how we come up with the equation of motion, and then how do we write a numerical integrator to to uh, simulate that that motion over time. And then in the next lecture, we'll talk about how we control that using fee using feedback control. Uh, in particular, a proportional integral derivative servo. And so when we're thinking about this, if we come back to our motorized pendulum, um, what we need to do is, is really start to think about this equation of motion. Um, this is going to be the, the thing that we really use in order to, um, in order to, to move, this, move this forward. Um, when we look at this equation of motion, we should note that, that, um, that it has a motor torque in it. That is, how we're, that, is how we're, that is our way to be able to control this, this type of system. Um, when we think about what that motor torque looks like, the way we generate that is we're given some sort of motor. So this is just a, a direct current motor that we have here. And I asked one of my um, uh, one of my first TAs for this this course is uh, Irina. Uh, I said, and Irina is an electrical engineer, and so she knows what she's doing with with building circuits. I don't. I'm a computer scientist. Um, I haven't soldered anything or in like 25 years. Uh, so um, so I said, Irina, could you build me just something that just shows off? Uh, shows off, uh, you know, how we can control a DC motor uh, using a potentiometer, on a, 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 um, a what we consider an adjustable resistor, and so that hooks up to a battery. And when we do this, we I'll show a video of it that whenever we decrease the resistance, that will increase the amount of current that flows to the motor and increase the force that the the, the force that's being applied, increase the motor the motor torque. Um, whenever we uh, whenever we increase the resistance, that decreases the force that's, that decreases the current, and that uh, that decreased current will produce a, a smaller force on the um, on the on on the on the motor from the from the motor. And so this is just me showing it. Turn the volume back up for this. So you know when I whenever I whenever I you you hear that that high sound that is that's when the the motor is running fast. Uh, the, it got lower when I when I increased the resistance, and so. And so this is just a simple circuit. Uh, electrical engineers are probably laughing at me uh, for showing this, but oh well. Um, but one thing I love is uh, that my, my daughter and I love, my kids and I love is snap circuits, right? And so, uh, so we tried a similar idea in snap circuits. Um, we were fortunate they had something like a, like a, so this is the design that my daughter built. And so, uh, so we basically built a stepper motor, so you can see that in the snap circuits. Um, so, uh, so as I, so the, the system is on, you can see the batteries going through. I turned that speaker off because that was annoying. If I, as I um, decrease the resistance, uh, you can see that the, that, that the, that the motor spins the, the fan faster and faster and faster. And that's just, you know, that's just allowing more current to flow over the motor. Um, and so that's how our, our stepper motor works. Um, and so I'll just let this video play out. And so we so we're effectively you know through that 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 adjustment of the resistor we can um, we can adjust the uh, we can adjust the um, the motor con that essentially gives us a, a motor control mechanism. 
And so when we think about uh, about what happens in the types of we don't we usually don't just get a motor itself. What we what we actually get is what's called a servo. Uh, the servo has a motor on it, and which is an actuator to produce motion. But it also has uh, proprioception, typically as an encoder. Uh, that allows us to know the state of the system, how much the, the motor has spun so we can get a sense of, you know, of where the joint thinks it is based off of the controls that we've given it or the motion that's been produced. Additionally, we also have a controller, uh, which, is, uh, which, is, which is an H-bridge, which will regulate the amount of current that gets sent to the, to the, um, to the, uh, to the, uh, to the motor uh, and to the actuator. And, uh, and that H bridge usually is going to do something to, to, you know, to essentially allow us to, um, to that, that will be the part of the mechanism that we use in order to make the, make the, um, make our robot arm achieve a desire, achieve and maintain a desired state. And I'll talk more about that next lecture, but, but this is sort of what's going on inside that we're trying to, we're trying to simulate. Um, inside of this servo, we can, we can do all sorts of things. And so just to give an example of just to sort of foreshadow and give some example of the type of controls that we want, we want to use on these types of systems, consider a inverted pendulum. So, uh, so this is where we have, um, this is where we have, uh, two wheels, uh, and they have motors on each, on, on each wheels and they're in a differential drive position. And what we're doing is, is, uh, was we're, we're creating a, we, we, the students in this class, so this is robotics 550 that I taught uh, a few, um, a few semesters back. Um, what this, uh, what this, what this robot is, what they're doing is, is writing controllers to make the robot stay upright. Um, just like your, your Segway style robot. And so, uh, so coming back, let's think about in order to make all of this work, we have to think about what is an, uh, an equation of motion. Um, this is, this is essentially what allows us to simulate our robotic systems. Um, and so our equation of motion in this case consists of, uh, of, of three real components that, that, uh, that follow the same form of Newton's second law, which is force equals mass times acceleration. In this case, we have net force on the, on one side, uh, and we, and that is going to be equal to Excel to our acceleration, which is the angular acceleration of our, of our, um, of our, the angular, the acceleration of our, of our angle, um, as well as inertia, which represents mass and sort of in, in terms of rotation about this axis. And so we could think of this as F equals MA. Um, uh, and so we're going to talk about each of these, but, um, but let's also note that acceleration is really angular acceleration. And when you see a, when you see an uh, expression like this with two dots over it, you should note that that is the second time derivative. Uh, another way of saying that is, is that's the, that is the rate of change of the velocity of the pendulum angle. So it's the rate of change of, of velocity. We could also think of that as the rate of change of the rate of change of the pendulum angle. Uh, and so, uh, and so, you know, and so that is, uh, that, that's, uh, it's really sort of talking about, you know, acceleration in that form. And, and if you haven't seen the, these, um, if you haven't seen these expressions, we'll, we'll do a little bit with that because, um, because we know that in, in order to understand what's going on here, uh, you know, a differential equation is not, uh, it's not a prerequisite for this class. We know we have to do a little bit, of, a little bit of, uh, of a mathematical refresher, and so I'm going to do, do do a little bit, so at least at least we all have some intuitions for what this stuff means. Um, and so when we're thinking about about this expression, what that is is a derivative, and that we can think of in this expression as the rate of change of the pendulum angle with respect to the variable t for time, and we assume that there is a um, there is a functional relationship that that the angle uh, that their system takes on is a function. Uh, this function that is that's dependent on time, um, and so but this doesn't have to be for the pendulum angle and time. It could be for anything. It could be any function uh, with respect to any variable. So we consider this to be uh, it's, you know some random function f uh, with respect to some variable a. Um, and so if we think about what this looks like, so we can consider. Let's say that this is you know, the evolution, you know, so A, you know, is just sort of some function where A could be time or could be something else. And, and on, and that's on the X axis and on the vertical Y axis is the resulting, uh, resulting output of that function. So A comes into the function and, and the Y and, the, and what is output shows up on the vertical axis. Um, we can evaluate this function at a point A. So, um, and so, you know, that, that gives us a, that gives us a, a point in space. Um, but imagine we could also evaluate a point that's nearby. So let's say we take, you know, along the x-axis, we shift over by, by h amount, right? Um, and so we could evaluate that point too. Um, if we take that and, uh, and we draw 
a line through both of those points, uh, that gives us essentially an, a, a rough estimate, uh, approximation of the rate of change of the function at A. Um, and so this is telling us how much is A changing uh, over, the over, the, the, over the sort of duration H. Um, if we make H infinitely, you know, as small as possible without hitting zero, um, what we're starting to get is the derivative, which is the slope of this line or the slope of, or the, uh, uh, the slope of this line as a, as, as H gets really, really small, essentially a H gets as close as possible to a without actually touching it. And so that, um, so that gives us essentially the instantaneous, uh, as close as possible instantaneous rate of change at a for, for, um, rate, the rate of change of F as a is at, at, for that, for, for that particular a. Um, we should note that there are different ways of expressing this. So, uh, so Lagrange has, has one way, uh, Leibniz has another way, uh, Newton has another way. And so all of this is, uh, all of these are different ways of thinking about that. Um, and so we should just note that when we're using Newton's notation, that assumes that, uh, that, our, that our independent variable is time. Um, and I should note, just aside that if you want to, if you see on the, on the discussion channel, I'm expressing things in, in LaTeX, uh, this expression that you have here, just a little bit of practice is what, uh, is how I would use LaTeX to, uh, to express that. Um, and just note that if I use D dot, I can get double dot. So you might see that as well. Um, and so the same way that we have the rate of change of the first derivative, uh, we can also have a second derivative too. So if we think of, you know, of sort of plugging in the rate of change uh, for, um, for our first derivative into what the rate of change would be over the rate of change, uh, that would be our second derivative and it could take on this form right here. Um, and so that gives us uh, the double dot. We should also note that, uh, that if our function has, uh, is expressed in closed form, that there are certain rules that we could use to find the, find the derivative. That process of, of finding the derivative is called differentiation. Um, and so we can perform differentiation using, uh, using rules such as the power rule, uh, the product rule, and the chain rule. They are here for you to look at, or you can go check out your calculus book. I'm not going to go that much deeper into it. We should note also that the um, that integration is the inverse operation of, of differentiation. So differentiation is about finding the rate of change at a particular point. Integration is finding the sum of all of the uh, the sum under a function. So you should think of this as how can we how can we find the area under the curve to find, uh, that's expressed by this function? And so uh, and so it's sort of the opposite. Instead of uh, sending instead of change, we're trying to integrate. We're trying to sum. Um, in addition, differential equations addresses uh, addresses differentiation for multiple for multiple variables. So let's say we have a function uh, function z uh, that is, that that depends on x and y as well as time, and that uh, the x and y are also dependent dependent on time independently. Um, we can express the partial derivative of z with respect to t in this form. And so this uh, this uh, this expression right here, I got to put on my my nerd glasses to see what that's about because I'm old. Um, and so, uh, and so in this case, X and Y are treated as, uh, as treated as constants. And so we're not really, you know, so we just assume that they are, you know, that they're not really a factor in this. And so we can just, we can just think about T as the only variable that we need to differentiate with respect to. Um, similarly, we can have what's called the total derivative, uh, that can, they can find via the chain rule, which will, which doesn't think of X and Y as constants, but we can, uh, but we can find the complete derivative in, in this form. And so, um, and so these are two different ways of, uh, this is how, how we sort of think about differential equations. I don't know, I don't remember if we're going to do any total derivatives, but we will come, at least in this lecture, we'll do a lot of partial derivatives. And I think all throughout the course. Um, let's not also forget about trig. So, so great from, uh, from, you know, I took uh, geometry in, in 10th grade, uh, back in the eighties. Um, and so, you know, so trigonometry is really important. I'm not going to go into it just to say that JavaScript has, I uh, have some very helpful routines in the math object um, where you can get the sine, uh, cosine, tangent, as well as the as well as the arc tangent um, uh, for 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 um, for you know for some type of trigonometric relationship. And so those are there. You should note that that's in the code uh, that's provided by JavaScript for you. So let's come back and let's think about this equation of motion and how how do how is this equation of motion derived? Where did this come from and how did we get this? Um, and so when we're when we're thinking about this, uh, you know, um, we should we should ask ourselves where did this this come from? And really, um, it comes from Lagrangian dynamics. And so I'm, I know I'm blocking that, but 
but we'll have to deal with it. But the Lagrangian basically of a, of a system just basically says, if you can find the, if you can express the kinetic energy of the system and then also express the potential energy of the system, you can take the difference of the, of, of, um, of the kinetic, of, you know, if you subtract away the kinetic, if you take kinetic energy minus the potential energy, that gives you the Lagrangian. And then we can form the equation of motion uh, using this using this Lagrangian that's, that's expressed here, this, uh, this, this formula that says, given the Lagrangian, we can uh, evaluate these partial derivatives as, uh, and, uh, and, the, and another derivative here, set it equal to, uh, setting it equal to the motor torque that's expressed at a particular degree of freedom. And then we can use that to, um, and if we can if we can perform if we can express this uh, the, if we can generate this expression we can generate that equation of the motion, and so just to to think about this real quick putting it together I would ask uh, I, I would have a question so for our for our um, for our simple pendulum right here what is the kinetic energy of this particle? Think about it, um, you know. Um, you know, uh, or, you know, maybe we'll start with this. What is the potential energy of this particle? Uh, so, so think about that real quick. I'm going to go get my, and remember high school physics, right? So I'm going to take my coffee. All right. Great. Um, so if you remembered, uh, remembered your, your, your physics from high school, you note that our kinetic energy for this party is, uh, for this particle is one half mass times velocity squared. And our potential energy is the mass of this particle times gravity times the height at which this uh, this um, this this particle is off the off the ground. And so, if we take what we see here and we rearrange it and put it together, uh, we can express the Lagrangian dynamics for our pendulum. Where in the case of our angle, the uh, the kinetic energy is going to be one half the inertia of the system times the velocity times the angular velocity squared. Our potential energy is going to be the mass times gravity, and we express height as the length of the pendulum times one minus cosine theta. Um, uh, and then, if we take this and we perform it into our Lagrangian, uh, we get the expression that we have here. And then, we, if we evaluate it with respect to, uh, if we evaluate that Lagrangian with respect to our equation of motion, um, then what we get is our is our uh, is our our um, is our is our equation of motion for the for the system here? If we can perform, if we can evaluate this expression, um, and so uh, so so breaking this down for those of us who have not had calculus or differential equations, let's just go through this step by step. Um, so let's start with our with, with taking the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to the um, to to the um, to the angle of our system, just the angle, the position of the angle. So if we take this. Um, you know, we'll, so we're going to, we're going to, we're going to evaluate this partial derivative. The only thing that we, the only variable that we can consider in this case is the angle, the position of the angle. We cannot, con the velocity will be constant. So in that case, what we're going to note is that our first term right here, um, is going to be constant with respect to, to theta that will differentiate from by that will differentiate, uh, to zero. And so we should note that when we differentiate this, we can uh, we can only we only have to consider each term separately, each uh, uh, additive term uh, separately. So this part will go to zero. Uh, when we think of the second half, what we're going second term, uh, what we're going to get is we're going to note that we have uh, mgl uh, times um, one minus cosine theta. Uh, if we distribute that and then remember our cosine identity for uh, for for differentiation, we will get the resulting a uh, negative mgl sine sine theta, and that will be our that will be our um, that will be our partial derivative with respect to the pendulum angle. Uh, now we're going to consider uh, now we're going to consider the uh, the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to the the angular velocity the, the velocity of theta. So now we're going to bring this here. We're going to note that this is equal to um, to this term here. Um, and so again, one of these terms is constant because uh, that is with respect to uh, that is with respect to the uh, the angle and not the the position of the angle, not the velocity. So that will go to zero. Um, and then we want to then when we want to integrate the then we want to differentiate the first term. Got to move my head out of the way. I'm going to try this side. Um, what we'll note is that uh, is that what we what we get is the the power rule can apply to the first term. Uh, and then when we apply that, we get uh, we get a new expression here. So that uh, that essentially will give us um, that will that will differentiate to uh, to the inertia times our velocity. So note that the two comes from the exponent and is multiplied by the 
multiplied by a constant in front, we, they, those twos just cancel themselves out. And so we end up with, uh, with that expression right there. Um, we should note that when we're, now we want to consider the time derivative of, uh, of, this, of the Lagrangian with respect to the velocity, of the derivative partial of the Lagrangian with respect to angular velocity. And we should note that inertia remains constant in this case. Um, and so that means that really that, that inertia is a constant. And so we can just, uh, so, so our theta, we, when, when we take the, um, when we differentiate that theta dot becomes theta dot dot. And so if we take these two ideas and, and uh, we tab those, we put those together. Now we have our two terms for our equation of motion and we, we, we put them together and that gives us our, uh, that gives us our equation of motion. Um, and so that equation of motion now, uh, now is directly what we can use to, uh, to represent. And so that is, that is how we derive this, but we need one more thing uh, to make, this, to make this, this nice because having that, that inertia out there is just no fun. Um, we should note that there is there is a relationship that will allow us to uh, to rephrase that um, that inertia in a way that will give us um, in a way in, in with respect to parameters that are directly relatable to our system, or at least the variables that we have, and that's the parallel axis theorem, and that specifies that when you have a mass that rotates about some axis, that um, that the inertia of that mass grows quadratically as the mass moves away from the axis. And so to give some insight about what this, what this looks like, um, consider a figure skater, right? Um, as that figure skater is going up, so they're going up, they jump, they do their twirl, and they bring their arms closer to the body because if their arms are out, that, that, uh, that essentially increases their inertia. So they bring their arms in because they're spinning about this axis that's going upwards. And so that, so, so essentially they're, they're making their, their inertia really, really small and that's, that gives them uh, the ability to spin around this vertical axis when in air. And then when, they're, when they want to steady, they spread, them, they spread themselves out wide. And that essentially gives them the, that gives them the chance to, um, to uh, uh, that gives them, uh, that, uh, that slows them down and a chance to steady for landing. Um, and so this parallel axis theorem is, uh, is really, um, is really um, uh, important. And so if we take the parallel axis theorem, that now gives us two terms that we can think about. Uh, one, uh, so we can have acceleration on, on one side uh, of our system, and then we can have the gravity term on the other, which only has, which the only real parameter we have to think about there is the angle of the, of the pendulum. And everything else is, is constant. Gravity is constant, and the length of the, the pendulum uh, rod is, is constant. Then we also have motor term, where the, um, where the only variable that we have to consider is the, is the um, is the is the is the uh, is the motor torque, and then the mass and the and the length of the pendulum rod are going to be are going to be held constant over time, and so if we have this, then we can try to think about how this would evolve over time, and that's where where this comes in, which is our uh, which is our numerical integration, um, and so I would uh, I and so that numerical integration essentially allows us to configure that for any moment in time, uh, uh, update our system with respect to some some change. Um, does anybody know what this is? I'm going to give you a hint. Uh, any any guesses on what this is? If you don't know, here let, let's uh, let's let's try something. Here I'll give you something to even give it even more of a hint. The problem is when the castle moves from an elliptical orbit to a parabolic orbit. There's no mathematical formula for that. And we can. Calculate launch and landing, but without this conversion, the castle stays in orbit. You can't bring it back home. Maybe we've been thinking about this all along. How's that? Maybe it's not new math at all. It could be old math. Something that looks like the problem numerically and not theoretically. But math is always dependable. For you, it is. Oilers method. Yes. And that's ancient. But it works. It works numerically. So uh so there there's a. Uh... There's Catherine Johnson, uh, or being uh, somebody for playing Catherine Johnson. You know, so uh, she goes off after this revelation. She goes and and looks and uh, looks and looks in one of the, these old books, uh, you know, uh, that probably wasn't numerical recipes and see which we'll get to. Um, and then she finds it. And it's right there. Um, 
And so, uh, and so, you know, and so, so basically we're going to do the same thing and we're going to take that and we're going to use that Euler integration in order to make our, make our, um, make our, our pendulum, um, uh, make our pendulum simulated and, and do it over time. Um, the thing that I would say though, is that I would just, I would just say, I watched, I went, I took my, my two of my kids, they were, they were a little older time. I left the little one, uh, at home, but we went to go see hidden figures. The the, the day, the day came out, I'm going to, I'm going to pop up for this one. Um, but like, but like, you know, so, so the, the, as soon as hidden figures opened, I took my kids out and I'm like, we're going to go see this movie. And, um, and it was, uh, and, and so when we got to that point and she was like, Euler's method, that's great. I was just sort of like, I turned to my daughter and I said, don't use Euler's method. <laughs> and, that, and if there's one thing you should take away from this, from this lecture is don't use Euler's method, right? There's better integrators. Um, and so, uh, so I think, I think, uh, I think we'll, we'll see why that's the case in a, in a second. Um, so I'm going to go back down here. And so, uh, so let's, uh, let's see what happens. Let's, uh, so I'm going to go, I'm going to go out of this real quick. So it's just been around. I'm going to reload and I'm just going to bring it to a starting point. And then from right here, I'm going to let the Euler integrator go. And you can see that if my pendulum's working right, it should just swing back and forth, just sort of conservation of, of energy. But what you're seeing is, is this pendulum just sort of gains energy and it keeps spinning around, around, and around, 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 um, because Euler integrator integration is just not a good idea. Um, for, for many cases, it's a good way of starting to think about the problem. Um, but we've got, we've got other options. And so, so, um, and I would also just sort of, sort of point to, uh, to a great lecture, uh, where, uh, where, um, where a, uh, uh, where uh, an instructor, a faculty member, risked their life to prove to uh, to show why uh, why how the how the pendulum should work and the conservation of uh, of of of, um, of energy for a pendulum system um, and why Euler integration if we if we use that to simulate in this case would you know we wouldn't have this uh, this gentleman with us anymore so um, so I would just recommend this uh, this link it's a great video. Um, and so why is Euler integration not a, not a good choice? And so, um, so it really, we should think about this as an initial value problem. Um, so an initial value problem essentially says that, uh, that we're going to start off with an, uh, with an initial condition and our current state. And from that initial condition, from that time and current state, uh, what we're going to do is have a, have a, um, differential equation that says uh, that that can tell us what is the velocity, what's what's the velocity at that current time, um, and then also uh, also the uh, function that will give us the dynamics that will that will tell us what this what this velocity is from a current state, um, which doesn't have to be our initial state, it could be any state, but we're just uh, but in this case we'll start with this initial condition. And so our question with this initial value problem that our Euler integrator is solving for us is how do we estimate this this future state? How do we get the the next state? from this system. And the way we're going to do that is by numerically integrating over the, over the time step duration. So what, what our initial value problem is trying to do is say, if we're trying to think about what is the difference between where we are now and where we would be in our next, in our next state, uh, in terms, in, in, in a, in, in, in um, that is H, uh, units in time further, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to say that is equal to our integration over the time step. We're going to think about all the effects that are happening during that time step, and we're going to integrate them forward uh, to get our to get our next state. And what Euler integration is doing is that it's it's approximating this uh, this the integral of this time step by simply taking the initial rate of change that's given to us by our by our f function, right, which is giving us our our which is telling us what is the rate of change at the beginning of the time step. And we're multiplying it by the time step duration. And so we're simply doing that. In addition to advancing the state, we also advance time H in the future. Um, and so this is, so our Euler integrator is really just doing those two steps. Um, and to get a sense of what this, what, what should happen in this integration, if we consider the, the, um, the curve here to be the, the proper integration of the, of the system over time. And so we are at time T zero, uh, and which evaluates to Y, uh, at Y at T zero. Um, if we had a proper integration, that would put us at this uh, at this blue dot right here, which would be which would accumulate the effects properly and give us the correct integration result. Um, if but however, with Euler integration, all we're doing is really taking the slope of the of the line, the tangent 
at the at our current moment in time and just multiplying that out scaling it by the by our h value and that's what gives our, our integration that's where our air, air euler integration results and that gives us some integration error the further the larger h is the further we go out the more that error has a, has a, a chance to 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 um to grow um, and so as I tell you, numerical recipes in C is the unofficial textbook of this lecture. Um, it is my go-to resource for, for thinking about uh, numerical integration, even though it's not listed in the, in the class readings. Um, and, it'll, and, just, uh, and it'll tell you, you know, it'll go through Euler's method and how you can do this. So there's just two steps over a 2D point. We're gonna come back to this, by the way. Um, and so if we're thinking about this, if you're Katherine Johnson and you're thinking about this, uh, there's, you should note that we also forgot something here. Um, and that is that we have to consider second order state. Our, our system for our pendulum, we also have to, keep, we have to keep track of both the position and the velocity of the, of the pendulum in order to simulate it properly. And so that second order state means that we have to, and that's, that's what's needed for Newtonian physics, um, both position and velocity. So for thinking about how to do this integration, Euler's method for a pendulum is going to advance position and advance velocity. So it's going to advance position using the current, no, currently known velocity, um, but then it's also going to advance the velocity using acceleration. That acceleration is going to be coming from our equations of motion, and that's what we're going to use to update that that velocity. And we're going to denote this uh, the acceleration the uh, as y as um as as the as this uh, this function a right, um, and then then we can advance time, and that's really how our or or those methods are going to work for our our pendulum in, in this case. Um, so you should still be asking yourself, uh, why is this pendulum going unstable? It really is that that integration error um, to just see. So, but does that integration error really, um, does it really make a difference over a certain amount of time? And uh, and just to illustrate that, um, let's consider an Euler, uh, example Euler integration of a 2D point over four time steps. I stole this from Wikipedia. Um, and so, uh, so for Z, if we're starting from Y zero, um, and so this is just sort of the blue is the true evolution of state and, and red is the Euler integration. Um, if we look at our first uh, our first step here, just going back to it, what we're what we're going to do is we're going to think of our f as giving our, giving us our original tangent, um, our original sort of rate of change at uh, at y zero. We're going to scale that by the time step, and then we're going to extend that out. We're going to add that to our, uh, we're going to add that, that vector then gets added to our initial state, y0, and that gets us all the way to, uh, to, y, to y1. And then from that, we have some integration error that occurs, as we've said before. But now when we take that integration error and we place it with respect to our, our trajectory, and then we do this, this integration, then we do this Euler integration over multiple time steps at time two, for time two, time three, and time four, all of this error accumulates into this larger, larger integration error, and that adds up. That can add up pretty quickly to lead us to to our system, uh, to our to our integration of the equation of motion diverging from the true, uh, the true dynamical behavior. And so, there's many things that we could do to improve this, um, but two of those really come to mind directly. Um, and so, there's two options. You can pause here if you want uh, to see what they are. Um, but the simple thing. One thing that you could do if you don't mind waiting for a long time is you could reduce the time step. The, our error becomes becomes uh, becomes greater when we when we're trying to take longer steps over a, over a longer over over a longer horizon. If we reduce that time step, then we we can we can essentially not in, not introduce this this such great error. Um, but that will take more time, and that's not uh, and that's not going to make that's you know there's and there are other options that we could do. Um, one another one is to use a better integrator. Uh, and so for that, I would recommend us thinking about Verlet integration as one possibility. Um, our Verlet integrator is going to uh, essentially uh, is, is going to use an interesting idea to uh, to advance our position using using this formula right here. Um, and so this this formula essentially gives us a, a way of advancing position based off of um, based off of our, our the current state of our of our of our uh, of our system. Uh, where this comes from is uh, essentially a very interesting idea, uh, you know, just a, a clever bit of, of mathematics and that, uh, and that what we can do is we, if we think about our, our, our acceleration at a particular time as being approx as, as that, as, at, at a particular time n, um, being approximated by breaking it down into, into uh, approximated in, in terms of a breakdown of velocities 
And then taking those velocities and approximated by breaking those down into positions. Uh, once we have this expression, we can do a little bit of algebra and come up with this uh, with this um, this interesting expression right here, which we can then, if we if we relate it back, we can consider approximately equal to our to our um, to our acceler to our original acceleration with some order error that's introduced. If that error is not too great, uh, we can then infer that. Uh, and then if we set a equal to this to this uh, expression we have at the bottom, then we can essentially solve for for uh, for our next state. And that gives us that gives us what we have for our Verlet integrator. Um, so if we take that Verlet integrator, we just have to know that we need to uh, that we need to initialize because this integrator essentially assumes that we know not just the current step, but also the next step, and then we use that to get the step after that. Uh, or we could think of it as taking the current step with the previous step, uh, or current state with the with the previous state, and using that to get the next state. So we need to initialize this first, and then after that we can advance position and over over and over again. Um, and so let's let's just take a look and see what happens. So I'm going to go out. Now our system has started over here, and I'm going to start the Verlet integrator now. And so what you'll note with the Verlet integrator is, is that it swings back and forth. And really what, what's happening is that we have no, we're introducing no new, no new energy in the system. Energy is preserved. What's happening in this case is that that um, that whenever that when the when the pendulum starts at, starts the integration starts at a particular position, it has a particular potential energy. That potential energy dissipates as the as the ro as the um, as the pendulum comes down and is converted fully into kinetic energy when it's when it's at the bottom. That kinetic energy is then is then transferred into potential energy when it swings to the other side, where you've recovered all that potential energy energy back. Then it comes back, converts to converts to kinetic and in, in the bottom at the at the lowest point, then back to potential, and this will they, well, this will will um will essentially perpet you know, assuming that we have no friction on the on the um, on the motor axis, then this will spin uh, indefinitely, um, and so this really gives us a perpetual motion engine, sort of like Snowpiercer, uh, one of my favorite and most depressing movies I've seen, um, and so uh, and so uh, and I have not watched the TV show. If you're going to tell me anything about the TV show, please don't tell me anything about the TV show. I've only had a chance to watch uh, because 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 uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. I've only got a chance to watch one episode. So don't tell me about it. Um, but really, this is this is this is the type of integration behavior that we're we're expecting to see. Uh, so one thing that we should note is that uh, is that we that um, this is only based off of position, the position of the uh, of the um, of the pendulum. And so uh, so now how do we is there a way to get velocity from this as well? Um, and so Verlet integration also allows a way for to a way for you to include velocity as an optional step, um, and so you can you can use this expression to get it. Um, I don't really expect that for this class, um, but what I do expect that uh, that at least the undergraduate that everybody in this class will be able to do is uh, to find is use the, a cleaner alternative of, of this, which is uh, velocity, which is the velocity Verlet integrator. Um, and so what that's going to do is we're going to use our um, to get our position. At the at the at the in using the first uh, first expression here, we're going to take our current to get our next position. We're going to take our current position plus uh, plus the velocity, uh, the current currently stored velocity, maintained velocity times the time step, and we're going to add that to um, uh, to one half the acceleration times the time step squared. Um, in addition, we'll also take our uh, we'll also use our um, find our velocity by taking uh, by taking our uh, oh my goodness, I made a mistake. Blast. <laughs> so this should be, this should be a velocity right here. Um, I got, I'm going to go back and I'm going to go back and, and fix that. So that's, this is our current, uh, current velocity. This is our next velocity. And these are our accelerations. Uh, so this is our, um, this is our current acceleration and this is our acceleration, uh, after the time step. Now note in order for this to work, uh, we have to assume that the acceleration only depends on the current position. So we will, we can, we do have to do our position update first, and then use that new position update. This way, um, we have to use this new position update inside of this uh, inside of this acceleration in order to get our velocity update. So we have to note that that's the case, um, and I'm going to fix that on the slides. That drives me nuts when I make those mistakes. Um, so this is actually correct, uh, and so so I, I uh, so I need to take a dot out of there. But if we assume that that our state of our pendulum is represented by the variable x, and our velocity of our pendulum is represented by v, 
then uh, then we have then we have this expression right here, and I sort of use those interchangeably. Um, and so now we'll go and oh, see what our, now I'm going to reload my page right here. And now I'm going to run Velocity Verlay now. Um, so in this case, Velocity Verlay, same as the as the uh, as the Verlay integrator, it preserves uh, preserves energy converting from potential to kinetic, back to potential, back to kinetic, and we get the equal, equal amplitude oscillation about the about the center point. And that is really what we're expecting out of this integrator. Uh, so we have viable integrators. Um, you know, with, with, with Verlay, but really I want to talk about the workhorse that usually, usually we, that we use when we do integration of, of, of many different types of systems. And this gets to Runja, to the Runjakata family of, of integrators. And so, um, Runjakata really talks about the family of numerical integrators that take, take this form right here. Um, and so, you know, so I'll, I'll let you go read about it. It's not one particular integrator. It's a, it's a collection. Um, and that collection of integrators is, is, is really, really expressed by all of these, uh, by, by essentially these parameters of, about the integrator, such as B and, and so forth. And so it sort of breaks out in this form. That's a lot to read, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that, but, um, but, you know, but it really expresses these dynamics in, in this, with respect to these parameters, you can, so the butcher tableau essentially gives you a way of expressing the parameters of all our Runjakata methods. Um, that's a lot to read. You, I'm going to let you go read about that on, on Wikipedia, but I want to talk about some of the more interesting, uh, instances in time, in terms of the, in, inside of the Runjakata space. Um, um, and so, so, uh, so if we think about the order of the Runja of the, of, of, of Runjakata, different types of systems that will induce a number of different, uh, a number of different, alg a number of different integrators. If we consider our, our, uh, a Runjakata of, of order one, uh, essentially that gives us Euler's method. And so I'll let you, I'll let you, you know, think about what that, what that might look like, but, but Runjakata one inside this family is, is Euler's method. Um, a more interesting method is the midpoint method. Um, and so this is one possible RK, R Runjakata two method. Um, and so these are the parameters for, for, for this. And so, uh, and so I'm just express, I'm showing those parameters for this second order, uh, second order system, um, that really is sort of taking, a, uh, uh, taking a, taking, um, uh, tangents at, uh, sort of taking two tangents and, and, uh, and blending them together equally. Um, what this really looks like. So I think it's, I think looking at that butcher tableau is just, it, it could be a little bit much, but let's think about it this way that really, if we're starting off at, at, uh, at, at TN, that's our current time. What we're going to do is we can think of our, of our slope, our tangent as being the line that comes out there. So that's the, that's the red line that we see that we're seeing out here. Apologies for people who are colorblind, but that's, that's our original tangent. But what we can do is take that original tangent step to the midpoint. So we're not going to take, we're not going to take the full H step. We're going to take a half H step, half of that. And then we're going to evaluate the F there and figure and, and get that tangent. Then we're going to take that tangent and then we're going to come back. We're going to take that tangent, bring it back to the start and then step along that tangent to get our, to get our final integration. And that, and that midpoint method, uh, turns out to, uh, to, um, to work reasonably well. This is just showing this respect with respect to numerical recipes and C. So instead of taking the big step, it's got the trial midpoints and then steps along those midpoints. Uh, again, highly recommend numerical recipes as, as a reference to go look back to. Um, and so we can see in this case, so this is, a, this is just a, 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 a nice example um, uh, from, uh, from, from one of, from, that I found online that just shows the difference between Euler uh, and how you can how you can get this it big integration error in the midpoint where it actually can get a can get a much better a much better estimate um, and so this is this, this is a, this really usually provides a better approximation of the of the integration um, and even midpoint can be we can improve upon that and that gets us to sort of the workhorse integrator that 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 we always sort of come to think about um, and that is the the Runjakata four uh, integrator. Um, this integrator really is doing, if you go back to calculus, is integrating Simpson's rule. So if you go back and you look in your calculus book and you know, th and you, you know that your integration problem has a, is a definite integral. So it starts at, at, um, starts at A, ends at B, and then we're trying to find the function, the integration of the function from, from A through B. Um, what we can do is use, uh, is use our RK4 essentially was going to let us, let us implement Simpson's rule in this form. And so we're really going to, we're going to, we're going to generate something. We're going to, to express this in terms of an integrator. 
Um, what this looks like in terms of butcher tableau is, or these parameters, man, it just makes my head hurt just looking at that. Um, so let's make that, let's, let's try to make this a little bit simpler. Um, that what we're trying to do, if we go back to, to, the, to, to what our integrator is doing, is that it's taking, it's advancing the state and then advancing time, right? And so the advanced time is pretty simple. We just take time and add, add our H duration to it, uh, time step duration to it. But state, we need to break down a little bit more. And what we're really doing with this is taking a combination of integration trials points, the same way that with the midpoint method, we take a trial, a trial um, we find the slope at a trial at, at the midpoint, and that can become our trial, our trial tangent that we then use to integrate forward. We're gonna do this at four different points and then average them all together. We're gonna do a weighted sum of them all together. And that's what's happening on the inside. And so what we're doing here, we're taking the tangent at the start that's given to us. We're gonna take a tangent, at, we're gonna take one midpoint trial tangent uh, that, that's gonna come from that original tangent. Then we're gonna use that, that midpoint tangent to generate another midpoint tangent. Then we're gonna use that mid second midpoint tangent to generate uh, the tangent at the end of the interval. And that's gonna give us three tangents. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna take a weighted sum of all of them together and that's what's gonna produce our, our, uh, our, advancement, our advancing of state. Um, and so, so if we go back to numerical recipes, which provides to me the most, the most, I just understand this a lot more. We just think of our original tangent. Um, let, me, let me pop up real quick. So we think of our original tangent right here. So that's what we get at the beginning of our time step. Then we get a sample tangent uh, two right there. Then we're going to take two and and use two to, in order to at, from the, from the start and use that to get us three. And then we're going to take three from the start and get us four. And we're going to take all four of those tangents, weighted sum together, uh, you know, and then that, that's what gives us our, our final output. So this is just a comparison, seeing all of these together, which I think is uh, helpful, illustrative. Um, but let's turn this into, into a method. So let's just remember that we have to do this Runge-Kutta both for, for position and velocity of our state. Um, and so we can essentially say that that's, you know, that's our Euler integrator sort of gives us that to begin with. And that's, uh, that's what we have here. Um, now we're going to take, now we're going to, to integrate that, that original, um, that original tangent to get us, uh, uh, to get our position midpoint tangent or tr our second trial trial tangent at this step. We'll also do the same with velocity, noting that we have to use the acceleration given that, given that state. Uh, so we have to use our acceleration function. Uh, that is going to be our equation in motion that we get here. That gives us our, our velocity. Now we're going to use that velocity that we have from the trial, from the trial midpoint to then generate our, uh, our, generate our, our third tangent for position. And that's what we're going to have here. Note that for once we once we generate that trial step for velocity, then we have to compute the acceleration again in order to get that uh, in order to get that that tangent for for the velocity. Then we're going to take our our last uh, our last step towards to our last tangent toward towards the end, and that's going to get us uh, that's going to give us this expression. Noting that we also have to use acceleration at that after after that uh, that tangent in order to get the velocity at that step. Once we do that, we will take our weighted sum of, of these velocities to update the position uh, based off of, based off from the butcher tableau, we have the, we have the, 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 um, the, the sum, the weighted combination right there. Um, and we're also gonna do that for the accelerations as well, noting that we have these acceleration properties right here. So really, you know, I mean, really what we're doing is we just have to note that that what we're we're using the expressions at the top in order to fill in what we need here at the bottom. So uh, so so just think about about that as you implement for the graduate students as you implement your RK4. So let's just see what happens. So and so I'm going to start my pendulum again. And now I'm going to run my RK4 through to one. There we go. And so that's my RK4 running. Um, it should be no surprise. Just as the as the verle and the vo velocity er uh, verle. Uh, um, integrators work, our RK4 does the same thing. We get equal amplitude uh, um, uh, oscillation. Uh, so given that, um, let's revisit our, uh, so we should have, we should be able to do a, a one degree of freedom robot arm really well. Let's see if we can take this to, uh, to two degrees of freedom. So let's take our, our planar two degree of freedom link arm. 
uh, and think about what that might look like in reality. And if you if you take some time to think about it, uh, really what we're talking about is a double pendulum. And so one of my colleagues, uh, John Laird, was nice enough. He bought this on Kickstarter. I was immediately fascinated by this, and I was like, John, you got to let me see this thing. Can you can we can we go do a, a trial with it? And uh, and John John was nice enough to oblige me. Um, and so uh, so I'm gonna turn down the volume for this. And so we just took it out and we uh, and we literally took it for a spin. Uh, and and um, and this is what uh, this is the behavior. And so really, you know, there's no motors on this, um, but you could think of this as a planar two link arm. And how can we how can we think about the dynamics of the system? You note know, it's not this nice behavior that we had with the, the single pendulum. It is a bit more complicated. Um, and so we can kind of see what that would look like for uh, once we get to the equations of motion. So let's ask this question. Can we add another link? Can we get a double pendulum? And as you can see, this gets uh, this this is not as, as simple as our equation of motion for the single pendulum. Um, so first thing we have to do is, is again express the and I stole this completely from uh, from from that uh, from that that uh, URL right there. So you're welcome to go go see that. Um, um, but you know, and, and we've had a number of people be able to just uh, do this on do this on our own as an interesting exercise. And for the graduate students, I would I really recommend doing it on your own. Um, but let's say we start off. We're going to first note the locations of the of the pendulum bobs, express the kinematics of our system. Once we do that, we can express um, both the, posi the, the uh, potential energy and the kinetic energy to then phrase the Lagrangian, which we see here uh, highlighted. Once we have that Lagrangian, for, so can... the pendulum bobs are expressed in sort of the Euclidean space, uh, we have to express this, and that's sort of the X and Y location of the pendulum bobs. We need to rephrase that in terms of what that would look like for each of the degrees of freedom, because that's what we care about: the evolution of our of of the of the uh, of the alpha values, which are which represent our degrees of freedom. And so we have to change this into generalized coordinates. Once we have our Lagrangian expressed in generalized coordinates, uh, we can then express the equation of motion by then taking our Lagrangian, evaluating it with respect to the first degree of freedom. And so we're going to take partials with respect to the position and velocity of only the first degree of freedom. And then, uh, and then that gives us this expression down here. Um, then we're going to do the same thing for the second degree of freedom. And we're going to get the, we're going to get the Lagrangian that results. Then what we should note is now we have two variables and two equations uh, for each of our degrees of freedom. We put those together and then, uh, then that gives us our, uh, that gives us our equations of motion for a double pendulum. But we, uh, but we also need those to be equal. We want the, only the accelerations that we have here are two variables to be on the left-hand side. So you have to think about what uh, about how to make that happen. And then you should also think about what happened to the the torques in the system. How do we where the motor torques go because they're not present in this in this derivation. So so Omar Harib, uh, you know, is is a great student, great student who took this class. Working with Jesse Grizzle right now, uh, he he was the first person that I sort of challenged to do the pendulum two and, and have it be motorized. And so he did a great job of this. Let me let me go see if I can pull his up. So so he, you get this this behavior out of the out of Omar's pendulum, which I think is great, which which, which I thought was fabulous when he did it. Um, I believe I'm gonna put my nerd glasses on here for a second. Um, so I believe he can turn his controls off. So I'm gonna turn turn on the controls. Um, oh, we had a numerical error. So one thing you should note is double double pendulum. Uh, I don't have the time step set, set right. I need to I need to shrink the time step. But um, whoops, let's try this again. So this is Omar's pendulum swinging, and so if I turn on the servo. Uh, it goes to this position right here, and so now I can uh, I can change some of the desired angles. Uh, so we'll get to this in the next class, but um, but I can uh, I can change some of these desired angles, and then move my move my robot around, right? So I'm moving the first degree of freedom, now I'm going to move the second degree of freedom, back and forth, and so really I have sort of a two degree of freedom, a, a planar two link arm, except it's now it's not just in the plane, it's up upright and I can simulate those dynamics. And if I turn off the servo, uh, it just falls back. And then we have, uh, we have our arm right there. And so this is really, this is really cool. It's our beginnings of doing this, but you should note going from the, going from the, and then it blows up when I turn the servo back on, that time step really does need to get smaller for this system. Um, uh, and so, um, cause it's really, you know, it's really big time step right now. Um, but the one thing you should note is that, uh, is that going from 
the single degree freedom robot arm to the double pendulum uh, to the two link, there's a big step there. And so, um, so you're going to do this as part of uh, part of project two. This is the pendulum arm. Uh, this may reflect the old code. So you know. So I think. Uh, so I think uh, Lizzie Gettle has, has made some updates and, and Jemming has done things too to make it work with the CI grader. So you should just note that this, w this may be a bit different, but, um, but what you'll note is that there's gonna be places for you to put your integrators. Um, so you'll put each of your integrators there as well as plunking in the, uh, the equation of motion. For double pendulum, you're gonna have to do a little bit more for, for those that, that do this. And so we're gonna we're gonna move on from there. Um, and so what I'll do is uh, so in our next lecture we're, we just talked a little bit about in the in um, with respect to control with respect to Omar's uh, double pendulum. Uh, we're gonna go into more of that uh, next lecture. So uh, we're gonna do control um, and uh, and so we'll talk about motor control and PID servoing. And so um, so with that, thank you very much. I, uh, I appreciate your, your time. So, uh, so I'm going to go and just say thank you one more time. I appreciate listening. I know this lecture was a little bit long, but I think it really does provide a good, good basis. And so, so I appreciate it. Thank you very much.